You're listening to KEP, a series of stories from Mora community members sharing their memories of people and place. Listen to Margaret Mippy's childhood memories of Mora as told by Cindy Moody. Clark Street was beautiful with the river along there. There was open country all around. As kids, we used to come and have our swims here, Anna, or go to Grandma and Grandpa's. I remember the gum trees, beautiful. Skittles was the main game we played, girls against boys, yawn. Get our tins of muddy water and swing them around like that. And rounders, we used to get stung up, hit with the ball all the time. Boys start fighting if they got stung up too hard, but it was good fun. It's where the boys met the girls. Cheryl Chipper, Kelly Pryor and Margaret Mippy shared some yarns about life on Clark Street and Mora. In this episode, their memories are retold by Cindy Moody. When they got older, they were sitting around playing cards. That used to be the thing. They'd have good card games. The kids would go and entertain themselves running through those puddles there. The creek used to flow through here. Sometimes when it flooded, we'd have water laying everywhere. We used to play in that. It used to be real muddy too, driving up to the house. They had gardens, desert peas. Rosie Pryor's house had beautiful rockeries in her garden with sturt desert peas cascading over them. The tourist bus used to pass by and look at her garden. In this episode, Margaret Mippy and June Headland share yarns about the camp near the railway in Mora. Their story is narrated by Cindy Moody. It was next to the railway, so the railway mob had somewhere to camp when they worked. The workers stayed there with their families next to the workshop. Honey Flossie and Frank Narrier was round the corner from Grumps. We were here as kids. Over near the bridge was Ernie alone. Here is the Midland Dam. It was used to fill engines up with rainwater, but nowadays it's a sewage dam. The town used to water the main oval with it. If you had a graze or a scratch on your leg, it would often fester in the early days, but then the kids became immune. There was a big storage tank over there. Then there were stockyards. They used a chute to get the cattle off the train. When we were here, us little kids, Margaret and Daphne, Gordon and Philip, Beverly, me, Maxine and Colin and Percy and Josie Isaacs and daughter Violet. So we had a lot of kids. You had the dam, the river, the railway line, the stockyards in Moore Street, where the barracks are. We were always amongst the busy, busy goings on, but we never got into trouble. We had a little community here. We would have had two tents, their tents, Percy Isaacs and Josie and Flossie, and your dad would have been the first tent. They had a tent and a sleeper kitchen. They used to use the Jarrah Railway sleepers for floors. Josie Isaacs and Percy, their tent was on the bank of the Moor River. It was a very busy station with trains running all the time. The passenger train, the Midlander, ran up and down. We loved going on the Midlander. All of the Aboriginal employees had free passage. The workers and their families didn't have to pay, so that was all right. You had all the goods trains coming in and out, up and down, so it was a quiet place to be, but we survived. Three o'clock in the morning, you'd hear two toots at the two crossings. Midland Railways had buses as well. This episode features Diane Mippy's Memories of the Old Reserve. It's narrated by Cindy Moody. When people walked from the Old Reserve, we would hang around the clock in town and yarn. 
The reserve people would catch up with the town people when they were in to do their shopping. There used to be benches to sit on in the shade of the trees. Gone now. They didn't want Noongars hanging around. There were also big grey rocks to sit on around the clock. This episode features June Headland's memories of Clark Street and the Mora Drive-In. It's narrated by Daniel Hansen. We used to walk to the drive-ins from Clark Street. Maitland Colbung had a tilly lantern. He would walk us down to the creek to help us see us safely across. There were no street lights then. Then he'd come back when the drive-in finished to meet us. He had big water boots. He'd carry the little ease across. The big girls would climb along the fence. Then Maitland would walk us back again in the dark. In this episode, Colin Hedlund tells us about growing up in his hometown, Mora. These stories are narrated by Daniel Hansen. Every five miles along the Dandarrigan Road to Mora was a sheepyard and a well. The blokes who looked after the sheep were called shepherds. They were a mix of Noongar and Wajala. At night they had goats with bells on. These goats would stay on the outside of the sheep rounding them up, keeping them safe from dingoes. The bush was thick then and there were wild pigs. The shepherds also had little fires all around the sheep to keep them safe. Tutra was the main shearing shed for those farmers who didn't have their own. They'd all take their sheep to them. That's old Ted Hedlund Sr.'s story. There's a salt lake on the edge of town. They used to bag up the salt. It was cut into big blocks from the surface and sent to Perth. It was also sold to the farmers as salt licks for the cattle. My dad used to buy from little Jimmy Hill. There were three little brothers. They used to cut the blocks. Dad would buy a block of salt then smash it up with a hammer for the family. It would last a long time. We would scrape the red sap off the tree and boil it up then strain it to get all the bits of bark and dirt out. This mixture was then painted on a wound. It really helped heal quickly. We used jam tree gum, manna gum, which was like glue, and wattle, which was sweet. When I was only a little kid, mum showed us how to get the manna gum. You just put your finger under the hard shell, like a little turtle, to get the soft gluey bit to suck. She told me never to bite it, Because I was very young, I did bite it and the gum stuck my teeth together. I had to run home about a mile. Mum had to get a butter knife to use as a wedge to prise open my teeth. I got torn right off. In this episode, we learn about bush tucker and medicines on Ewart Country. The stories are shared by Evelyn Dawson and told by Daniel Hansen. The main food was kangaroo and damper. That's what we used to live on and any other food we used to find in the bush. Kwandongs for jam, karano, bush berries, snotty gobbles, two types of gums and sour grass. We used to eat sour grass all the time. But yuck, you look at them now and make you want to throw up. <laughs> we used to go jam gum picking all around Yuak country. Jam gum is an opening medicine. If you were constipated, it would fix you. The manna gum is really good for diarrhoea. It stops it. The tree has a yellow flower and grey bark. The black boy is a good plant. We use the gum like a putty for blocking up holes in the tin roofs of the humpies. It also produces bardies, the fat white bugs. The gum and wood is great for starting fires. Evelyn Dawson remembers the sign she was taught to tell the weather. Her memories are narrated by Cindy Moody. When the black cockies and the red-tailed cockatoos would fly around and make a lot of noise, the old people would cry, Rain coming! And the little ants would crawl all over the place, all around everywhere, 
little mingers. There were lots of signs like that in the bush. In this episode, you'll hear all sorts of memories about Magumba, everything from little men to hunting emu. These stories were shared by Sylvia Mippi and they're told by Daniel Hansen. There was a deep pool at Magumba, round pool, with no bottom, so Dad told the kids not to go down there. We used to stop at Magumba, but we were told not to stop at night time because of those little cheeky hairy ones. They would throw rocks at you and you get tormented all night. You never got any peace at night. Travellers used to camp there at night time and they never got any peace. As kids, we would have to watch out for the black tracker. They would wait till Sunday when they knew the kids were there with their parents. They let them have a feed and fill the little bellies up. And then it was time to go back to Magumba Mission, 10 to 15 kilometres away. All the parents would live at the river camps. They were going to see the kids on Sunday at the compound. That's what we all used to call it. That was the best day the kids dressed up. It was the only time they could see their parents. Ned wrote to the government for a work permit. He became a trackmaster and railway repairer for the railways. Mugumba wasn't a nice place. It was like cattle being herded. The older kids used to protect the little winyards from predators. Mum was a little housemistress, even though she was so young. Nungars had to get permits to get kangaroo and emu and to go onto the farms. Some of the farmers would say no. This meat was the main source of fresh, good, healthy food. There were also lots of kanos at Magumba Oval. When it was law time, some of the kids would escape and they would travel following the water and go back home up north for law time. Dad took the kids out like the naughty ones at St. Joseph's for cultural things. Roberta Mippi shares with us her memories of her dad, Ned Mippi, and the many happy times on the reserve. Her story is narrated by Cindy Moody. Dad Ned Mippi was a member of lots of different things in Mora. He also got lots of awards. I was born at Magumba. Later, Dad brought us up this way into Mora. We made a family home here. He was a great go-between for Wedjala and Nungas. He would take music out to the reserves like Magumba. He tried to heal people with music. It made them happy and helped with domestic violence. He really cared about people. When he retired, he taught languages, Noongar language and cultural things. With the language, you can connect and have cultural awareness. How we eat our bush tuck away, teaching them how to go out bush, like today with the viruses, there's plenty of bush foods if you know where to look. I went to kindy at the reserve. I remember Alice Worrell and William Moody. Then I went into town kindy and then high school. Dad used to take us out for gums at Bajingara Road. There were huge big trees, gum trees. We used to make toffee gum sometimes. We make it sweet. We also used gum to cover the books. My uncle Reggie and Auntie Ali showed us where to get bardi grubs, but I didn't like to eat them raw. You got to put them in the fire and cook them like twisties. We also had bush berries. I remember the fig tree and the mulberry tree across the road from the old camp. I must have been about five years old. Willie Worrell, Alice's father, took us walking in the lake. He had a long iron stick. What's that for? I asked him. Finding turtles. Come here, little girl. I'll show you how. Can you hear that tapping on the shell? Then he pulled out the turtle all right from the mud and I seen the long neck and head like a snake. I ran through the yucky, sticky mud. He couldn't catch me. Old Willie Worrell was just standing there killing himself laughing. Another place we used to go was Shanaway's farm along the river out of Magumba 
with Billy Miles and Nina Parfit, his wife and her kids. Dad would set nets down for cobbler. We'd run around the old broken down homestead. They had lots of fruit trees, grapes and mulberries. It was great hanging out in the bush. You felt free, you know. Another spot Billy and Wynne would take us was Regan's Ford. We had a camp on the side of the river. We loved it there. Us kids jumping in the river, we had fun, lovely. Like paradise for me as a kid. No one shows the kids nowadays. They just hang around town. I would like to teach these kids the language in school. Go out bush, it cleanses you, clears your mind. Just to walk looking, bird watching, looking at the flora. Beautiful, the scent of the flowers. These memories of Magumbra are shared by Evelyn Dawson. In this episode, Evelyn's story is read by Cindy Moody. Magumba was the biggest settlement. Good things that we did were to go fishing and swimming. We used to swim all the time in the river at Round Pool, Blue Pool and Elbow Pool. We had picnics down by the riverside. There were plenty of birds, gulbardi, magpies, crows, mudlarks, jitty jitty and all the galahs and cockies. We sat in the river in the sand. We had no esky, so we buried our drink to keep it cool. Up the river in the deeper parts, we'd fish for mullet. We'd chuck in a net, cause mullet don't bite hooks. There was also jilgi, catfish, the one with the whiskers, marin and turtle. One kid caught a long necked turtle on her fishing line. She thought it was a snake. She ran with the turtle, still on the line to get away. All the grannies ran toward it to grab it. We cooked it up and ate it. It was lovely. We used to live in Magumba when we were kids. We would camp way up past the dump. There was a school on the hill. We used to walk from the camp to the hill until we got reported to the native welfare. Then we got put in a home at Unorcia. In this episode, Gary Mippy shares with us his childhood memories of the Mora Reserve. This story is narrated by Daniel Hansen. Remembering my young days, I can recall the days at the Mora Aboriginal Reserve when I stayed with Nan and Pop Naria. With other kids at the reserve, we would go down to the river. We used to gather duck eggs along the riverbank. We'd also dig for plants we called chewy gums. We called the plant vinegar sticks. We would dig down to the plant's root and there we would find a long, fat tuber that was sweet and would stretch out like chewy gum. On the top of the reserve we would dig for carnos. We would find a vine entwining the jam gum trees and follow the vine down to the ground. Then we'd start digging until we found yam. They were sweet. We would also find snotty gobbles on the jam gum tree which is a pink berry. It was sticky and sweet. Small fish were also in the river. Our nan and pops told us not to eat them. But we were inquisitive at our age, six to ten years old, and we would try them out. They were not poisonous. Also, there were jam gums, nice and soft, and the manna gums on another tree. We would collect as much as we can roll into a ball shape. Then we put it in boiling water and added sugar. It would come out like toffee. There were also puddings a green like berry that grows on the ground surface. They were also sweet. At the top end of the reserve hill, there was also a berry bush. After the rains, we would start looking for that bush. It also had berries, very sweet. In this episode, narrated by Cindy Moody, we hear a collection of stories about life at Wanamol, as told by Evelyn Dawson and Diane Mippy. We used to get turtle at that big lake on the other side of Mora, Lake Wanamol. The turtles were deep down in the mud about half an arm's length. We found them by poking down with a stick. You hold them by the neck behind the head and pull them out. 
but I don't eat them now, it seems cruel. We have money and plenty of choice in the shops. We didn't have a choice then, we ate what we could get ourselves. Don't eat the kangaroos round here anymore. They don't taste so good with all the runoff from the farms going into the river. Still like getting the bush foods though, none around here now though. Gotta wait for the rains. Then the carnos start growing. They are juicy and sweet. Carnos only grow in particular places. I only eat kangaroo from up near Waluna, Leonora and Newman. Beautiful country. The roos are good from there. We eat emu. Emu steaks, we call it. Lovely. Mum used to stuff pillows with the feathers. You had to wash them really well with soapy water for the emu smells and to get rid of the emu lice. Fred Mogridge still hunts. This podcast was produced by Can in partnership with 100.9 FM Noongar Radio. Place Names is a creative exploration of the meaning and stories of Noongar places, developed with Professor Len Collard of Mujar Consultancy. It's supported by the Australian Government's Indigenous Language and Arts Program and Australia Council for the Arts. For more information, head to canwa.com.au. Thank you.